Here at the Seattle Atheist Church, the members ourselves give many of the talks. We have a planning meeting every quarter that's open to the whole community where we brainstorm ideas for talks we'd like to hear and talks we'd like to give. Then we vote on the ideas and schedule the talks that get the most votes. For today, please join me in welcoming Deb to give a talk about leading a life of quality and integrity. Deb, you have the floor. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, so this uh, talk is really based on a book um, by Angelus Arian called The Fourfold Way. And um, I'm certainly no expert. I mean, I, 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 after putting up the title of this, I started feeling a little intimidating, like I'm gonna lecture and telling people how to have quality and integrity in their lives, but it's kind of fitting for the book. And so uh, with that in mind, uh, certainly uh, myself as everyone is, is you know, trying to learn and work how we can do that to live life of quality, live life with integrity. So. With that, I just wanted also to describe a little bit about integrity um, and kind of what we're meaning or what I'm meaning about that um, in today's talk. And that is being able to live your life in accordance with your own internal set of beliefs that um, you're true to yourself, you might say. And so we'll get in more of that here in a little bit. Um, people with integrity often are described as being trustworthy, uh, being honest and being kind. So if that's something that appeals to you, then you know maybe there might be uh, some things in today's talk that will help. Um, <clears throat> in um, Angela's Arian, she was um, a cultural anthropologist. She was actually born in Spain and moved to the US as a child, but she traveled around and studied uh, multiple cultures. And her work by doing that helped her to write this book to synthesize some of the learnings and some of the things, patterns that she saw, principles that she saw that seemed to be pretty consistent across all cultures around the world. So in her book, she gives examples from here in the US, uh, mostly in regarding to First Peoples and same in South America and um, Asia, all over the world. So it's not just uh, um, a Western view of things or first world view of things. Um, the book focuses on the four archetypes that I did bring up in the, um, in the write up on um, the talk today. Uh, within the book, when discussing these four archetypes, she has the guiding principles of each, the tools that you can use to help, <clears throat> excuse me, and better yourself for those, um, how you can use nature to maybe connect with that particular archetype, um, how you might express or experience the negative side of those different archetypes, and then questions to ask yourself, and some of them even on a daily basis that she recommends. So with that, I'll go ahead and go into uh, the four archetypes. And the first one is talking about showing up or choosing to be present. And in this, it comes down to accessing, as she talks about, as human resources. And in that way, I'm not talking about human resources as a organization within a corporate setting or something like that. We're talking about human resources resources that every human has within themselves. And that the three main ones that she talks about is the resources of power, presence, and communication. And what she talks about with showing up is this allows us to extend honor and respect to other people, you know, to pay attention to what's going on, to appreciate also the diversity within yourself and the other people and show that you can be, that you are responsible and dependable, again, not only to others, but to yourself when you're being true with yourself. And so with the right, right use of power, we have, as I said, power, presence, position, and communication that helps us work on, on things. So in communication, we're talking about, right, saying what we mean and doing what we say. So that's really kind of the base of trust and respect that 
we can gather. Um, the power of presence talks about bringing all four main intelligences that everyone has, our mental, our emotional, our spiritual, and our physical. And she actually uses the word spiritual a lot. Um, and in her book, she takes examples from all sorts of different places. But for me, in my, my context, I see that as just talking about being aware of connection to other things and other people, you know, connection to the earth, what's going on, connection to our past, to our future, so on and so forth. So she also talks then about the power of communication, about being able to align our content, timing, and context and with the congruity between our own words and our own behaviors. So some of us have been involved in the reading group about um, discussing and having, you know, heart-to-heart -heart conversations. And I think there's a lot of things about this that kind of fit in with that book as well. Um, and I think that book goes into definitely much more detail of explaining how can you do that? How can you align your content timing and context when you're talking with someone else communicating? And the power of position isn't necessarily talking about a um, organizational position but just a position being able to honor and respect the other people and yourselves, to be able to set boundaries and limits, to align your words and actions, and to extend responsibility, your own responsibilities in an empowering way. Okay, let me check my notes here. Um, when, um, when we look at some of that empowering of ourselves, we need to often ask ourselves, what are we willing to do? What are we not willing to do? And the problem comes in sometimes um, using the terms yes and no. And quite honestly, here in the West, and especially in the US, yes, we kind of take it to mean that, oh, we agree with you and we like you, and no means I disagree with you and I don't like you sort of thing. But in a lot of places, and even in Asia today, saying yes just means I understand. I understand what you're saying. doesn't mean agreement. It just means, yes, okay, I got it. I understand your position, what you're saying. And no is just really that of a boundary, not like I'm rejecting you, but no being this is what, here, here are my boundaries. Yes, I, I'm willing to do this. No, I don't think um, this is something that I would like to do. Um, so the responsibility and discipline that we have, uh, again, kind of taking a look at our cause and effect of actions that we take or inactions that we take. Um, and do we stand behind what, what we do and what we say that we're going to do? The, um, might say the shadow part or the negative side of this is often sometimes people might have a kind of an addiction to perfection, you know, having little tolerance for mistakes, feeling vulnerable if they're exposed for something. Um, they might feel more of rebellion or um, having authority issues, or maybe some invisibility, staying quiet, staying, trying to be unseen. Um, or maybe even riding coattails as someone more powerful and attaching themselves to, to that person. Um, so the question, there's several questions that um, she outlines for this. I think it's like 10 or 12 questions, but there's a couple of them that she suggests people look at daily. And that is take, take a look at it and say, is the good, true, and beautiful within me as strong as the whispers of diminishment? Or in other words, is my self-worth as strong as my self-critic? Right? And the way we, I mean, the answer to that might depend on what aspect of our life we're thinking about or what relationships or whatever, but you know, just just kind of touching in, touching base with yourself, touching inside to understand where you are. 
And then the second one is a little different. And it asks, um, where in my life did I stop dancing, stop singing, stop being enchanted with stories? Um, when did I become uncomfortable with silence? And, and the point of this is just saying um, to experience yourself, you know, as children, most everyone, we sing and dance spontaneously, right? We, you know, I, I don't know the last time I did a cartwheel, but I know I did a ton as a kid, right? That sort of thing. So not really saying doing that per se, but um, talking about singing just means, you know, where's your voice? Are you using your voice? Um, talking about dancing, are you moving? Are you doing the right things for yourself? So that's the first, first one. And that um, again is the look at uh, power. And she uses the term, some archetypes on this, um, that's the archetype of warrior. The next one is being the archetype, archetype of healer or love. And this is where we're really talking about paying attention to what has heart and meaning to you. And in her book, it's kind of interesting the way that she describes and talks about love in more of an esoteric intrinsic sense. She talks about in this one, this opens us up to the human resource of love, of, of love being displayed by acknowledgement, acceptance, recognition, validation, and gratitude, right? <clears throat> and usually when we acknowledge each other, when we do this, we can acknowledge other people because of their skills, because of their character qualities, because of their appearance. And by appearance, I'm not talking about fashion or you know their latest hairstyle. By appearance, we're talking about really seeing that other person, what kind of emotion, what kind of demeanor do they have? Do you, you know, oh, you seem kind of down today, that, that sort of thing. And, <clears throat> um, and then also, and the gratitude, just staying clear about what you like about that person, the impact that other people might make on ourselves. Um, she brought up the idea that we often talk about our heart when we talk about getting on with their life and trying to be authentic and trying to be true to ourselves. And so, you know, we frequently talk about people being half-hearted or close-hearted, so on and so forth. So she kind of takes those and she talks about the four-chambered heart and asking yourself, am I being full-hearted, right? Am I being open and really accessing what I know to be true for myself? Or am I being open-hearted versus Close hearted, close hearted would be like being defensive or protecting self. Am I being clear hearted? In other words, clear about what I want or what my understanding is, is of the situation, or am I being confused and doubtful? And strong hearted is the fourth one she talks about is, you know, am I being as close as I can to be all that I can be, right? Am I able to show courage? And the interesting thing about the word courage, I didn't really know until reading this book a few years ago, is courage, literally the word courage comes from the word heart, original Latin of core, uh, meaning heart. In old French, courage meant heart, kind of spelled a little differently, but I pronounce it that way. Someone that knows French might um, have a better pronunciation. Um, and then also, it came to courage the way we use it today in Middle English, denoting heart as a seat of feeling. So when, when we have courage, that's when we're paying attention to what has heart and meaning to ourselves and acting on that. Okay. To be able to um, do this, to have that courage, and to recognize that love takes courage. Um, it's been said, um, I, I didn't write down the name of the person, I'm sorry, she was quoting from a book. Um, it was a, a leader in the Olala Sioux um, tribe talking about the greatest remorse that anyone can have is the love unexpressed. 
And I think, think that's very true. And again, talking about love in this case, you're not just talking about between mates and partners or lovers. We're also talking about the love between parent and child, between colleagues and friends, um, even professional love, maybe fondness, <clears throat> excuse me, fondness or care might be a better term for a lot of folks, but you know, the idea between a teacher and a student. I think most of us have had a favorite teacher, right? You care a lot about, you learn a lot about, you liked a lot, right? Even therapists and clients, right? There's some connections that happen. Love of yourself. And then also a spiritual love of that, again, connecting to all parts of our world. So if we're opening ourselves to healing and to be able to improve on ourselves, then we're needing to open ourselves to love, to be whole, you might say. And she talks about healing this process being a lifetime journey. It's not something that we have arrived or we reach the pinnacle of it at some time and become the, the greatest person ever sort of thing. But it becomes being, again, that awareness of ourselves and opening what's been closed and softening to what has been hardened into an obstruction, right? So healing and love is really talking about creativity, expressing yourself and learning to trust life, right? Mm, let's see. So in this too, she talks about the, just the whole balancing of our lives. So talking about balanced diet, our exercise, time for fun and play, music, expressing, expressing ourselves creatively, um, love, touch, our support and social systems, engaging in interests, ourselves, getting time out into nature, into the environment. And quite honestly, before, I think she wrote this book before a whole lot of studies have been done, but in recent years, there's been a ton of studies talking about just getting out to nature, the walk or to the water, about how much of that affects us, our well-being and our social skills and just feeling better about ourselves. So the downside, you might say, to this one, if it goes to some extremes, might be an addiction to intensity. Um, where someone has a low tolerance for boredom or people that dramatize, exaggerate things, their life experiences, right? Um, and then also other addictions like for alcohol or sex or just any, any sort of thing that is really in the larger scope of things a detriment to yourself. Um, some of the questions that she asks is the, the main one, the one that you want to do every day is, what is the condition of my four chambered heart? Where am I being full hearted? Where am I being clear hearted? Where am I open hearted? And where am I being strong hearted? Um, and so with that, you might be also answering, you know, what blocks me from love? What blocks me from receiving love? Okay, so that brings us to our third one, uh, being able to tell the truth without blame or judgment, which in her archetypes is talking about the visionary. And to tell the truth, again, is voice to what is seen internally and externally, to be able to honor ourselves and others via perceptions, insight, vision, Um, she also talks about intuition, about that being a, might say, beginning point for ourselves. So if we intuit or see things and aware of that, you know, we can examine and learn more about our perceptions or what, at what point or what perspective are we taking, right, and we, when we look at something. Can we look at it a different way? The insight for that and the vision of being able to more holistically see the bigger picture and how this all fits in together. Um, in this case, the might say the negative side is 
being fixated on what's not working, maybe magnifying negative experiences, blowing things out of proportion, unable to see the blessings, gifts, talents, resources available. So the questions then and taking a look at thing is, things, <clears throat> excuse me, is what is my current capacity for truth telling without blame or judgment, right? What situations do I find myself feeling false or abandoned? Where in my life have I brought forward the creative aspects of who I am? Where do I look for guidance? So a lot of these questions I think are really good, not necessarily on a daily basis, but good to take sometimes when you feel like you're struggling or um, feel disconnected from other people, especially right now. I think sometimes going through some of these questions here, especially for this one, I, I think can be very, very helpful. And let's see. Okay. And then going on to the last one, I'm kind of running on time here. The last one is teacher or wisdom. And this one is being open, open to outcome, not attached to outcome. And I really think using the idea of a teacher is a good example on this, right? Because as teachers and that we've experienced <clears throat> good ones, right? They care, they're involved, but there's also a certain part that it's up to the student, it's up to the other person to do what they will and learn from what you've been able to um, talk about and teach them, right? So the teacher, as a teacher, you use trust as an instrument, which is really the opposite of control. So being a teacher means not necessarily controlling someone else, but again, providing the other person to be able to understand their own truths. And it's also important for the teacher to know when there's uncertainty, when they don't know something. And that's sometimes I think uh, in today's world, a, a harder thing to do than um, it needs to be sort of thing. Um, let me see here a second. The, um, the trust that I mentioned earlier, um, also about like seeing what you mean and do what you say, that being comfortable with uncertainty, that not knowing and being able to state that and maybe using other people to help go through and getting clarity on some of this as well, but also being comfortable with other people's um, uncertainty, they're, they're being unsure and that that's okay. So trust in them as well. Um, one of the, the shadow side or downside of, of this is talking about detachment and detachment, not necessarily as to um, uh, be totally gone, but, det but detachment as a way of saying non-attachment, that you still care, but you're letting go and getting the sense of sense of humor, keeping your sense of humor about things. When, when we um, keep our being at our detachment, but keep our caring, right? That allows other people to be themselves. And the other thing about um, having a sense of humor or just kind of relaxed, you might say thought processes with that. When, if you're in a conversation where that starts going away for you, that's kind of a clue that maybe there's something going on here and there's something that needs to be more fully understood or explained or uh, talked about, right? So keeping a sense of humor can help you remain flexible when being detached. 
and to calmly observe our reactions and, situa and situations when we get into emotional situations. Right. And excuse me, the shadow part of that is getting into patterns of judgment, control and positionality, right? So with judgment, the opposite of that, being able to get back to being objective and to have some level of discernment from the other people to um, patterns, anybody wanting to take control and all to relax and again, start trusting the other person and for a position or talking about, you know, this is the way it is or trying to really stress yourself strongly to the other person, you know, just being aware of having some flexibility of understanding what's going on. So a couple of the key questions that um, she has for this one is what is my tolerance level for silence and my capacity for being alone. So she talks about spending some part of every day uh, being uh, alone and having alone time and just being with yourself. And the second one that she talks about um, taking a look at every day is what current fears am I addressing? What am I consciously ignoring in my life? Which I, I think though, at least for me, those are kind of difficult questions to answer sometimes, right? If you're ignoring, sometimes it takes a while to understand that's what it is that you're doing sort of thing. And what, you know, there's certainly the aspect of wanting to protect oneself to um, stay safe. And so that definitely needs to be considered as well. So a lot, a lot of this stuff she talks about, it, it is said like, I mentioned before about cross-cultural and kind of around the world sort of thing, but also a lot of it really does um, fit for everyone, regardless of our family structures, our upbringing, things that have happened to us. You know, it, it's her position is we have an opportunity. It's everyone, it's work for everyone to try to be able to be truthful to, to themselves, to other people, and to try to live the life authentically. So her book and a lot of the other things that are out there about her, um, I think does a, um, a good job at giving, providing some tools and asking some of the questions and giving some examples of things to consider and think about as you try to go through and make your life more truthful and, and authentic for yourself. So with that, just one, one other side comment uh, on the book, I have to say there's a lot in the book that for some people, even for myself, seem a little woo-woo type of thing. And again, that's okay. I can just move on about that, right? And just kind of ignore some of that because I really feel like, and again, for speaking for myself, there's a lot of things in there that um, I can refer to and look back on. And it's kind of, I'm kind of actually glad that I brought up this and doing, doing this talk because I read this book first time, like, I don't know, 10 years ago, and I kind of read it every so often and all, but I hadn't really gotten to it in years. And lately with the pandemic and having a lot of alone time again, you know, doing more contemplation. So doing this talk or setting up for this talk allowed me to go back and, and read the book again and, and kind of re-familiarize myself with a lot of it. And I'm, I'm glad, glad I did. So um, I know there's some more work and things that I want to do for myself as well. So with that, that's my presentation and open for discussion. Thank you, Deb. Um, can everyone unmute themselves for a moment and give her a round of applause? <laughs> 